Hi, Work Well listeners. I'm really excited to share that my book, Work Better Together, is officially out. Conversations with Work Well guests and feedback from listeners like you inspired this book. It's all about how to create a more human centered workplace. And as we return to the office for many of us, this book can help you move forward into post pandemic life with strategies and tools to strengthen your relationships and focus on your well being. It's available now from your favorite book retailer. Relationships are vital to our health and well being. But with the rise of technology and social distancing in a worldwide pandemic, our human-to-human connections have suffered, especially in the workplace. How can we rekindle the connections that we have while building new, meaningful relationships in the remote or hybrid environments that many of us are working in? Now more than ever, we need to relearn the lost art of connection. This is the WorkWell podcast series. Hi, I'm Jen Fisher, Chief Wellbeing Officer for Deloitte, and I'm so pleased to be here with you today to talk about all things well-being. I'm here with Susan McPherson. She's a serial connector, seasoned communicator, and founder and CEO of McPherson Strategies, a communications consultancy focused on the intersection of brands and social impact. She's also the author of The Lost Art of Connecting, the gather, ask, do method for building meaningful relationships. Susan, welcome to the show. Jen, I am so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm really excited for this conversation. So tell us about you, who you are, your personal story, and then how you became passionate about meaningful human connection. But I have, from a professional standpoint, uh, worked for many years in corporate America, often in uh, marketing, uh, business uh, cultivation roles, but always had one foot out the door um, working in a philanthropic uh, capacity. Mm -hmm. Um, And then in 2005, I went to Afghanistan with a nonprofit Mm -hmm. that I was on the board of called the Business Council for Peace. And it was an organization that was um, basically a community of business um, executives that were um, coalescing their business acumen to help women um, entrepreneurs in regions of conflict and post-conflict. So we were working at the time in Afghanistan and Rwanda. And it was during that journey and during that trip that I really saw business being a force for good for the first time, like in real life. So I turned my entire career focus to work in impact and corporate responsibility work. Um, But from age five on, my real passion in life was connection and making connections and making introductions. And that stemmed from my late parents who in the late 60s and the 70s during my formative years were serial connectors and using the technology at the time to make those connections. So it was bred in me, if dare I say. (laughs) Um, And then, you know, as I got older, I founded my company uh, in 2013. And almost nine years later, 90% of our business has been inbound. So what that tells me is all those connections that I made in my 20s, in my 30s, a good part of my 40s actually came back to assist. You call yourself a serial connector, which obviously came from your parents. And I love that. But can you tell us what does it mean? How can we all become serial connectors? Well, I think first and foremost, you have to witness the joy that happens when you make connections in the universe and then watch the impact whether it means somebody gets a job, whether it means a company gets funded, whether it means a nonprofit is founded, whether it means somebody gets a great meal because you suggested your favorite restaurant because they have amazing hummus. (sighs) I mean, I'm being silly, but the thing is, is to appreciate why making connections is so vitally important is to witness what happens from those connections. And that that can't be taught, that has to be witnessed. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I have to believe, Jen, every single good thing that has ever happened in my life happened because of a connection someone made for me. When you think about it that way, I mean, my mind is racing now to kind of think about all the things that have happened to me in my life. And it, it's interesting because I've, you know, I've been at Deloitte for 20 years and 
a lot of times people are like, what's kept you here for so long? And my answer every single time is the relationships, the connections that I've made um, and what they've meant to me and to my career. And mm -hmm. so it just, that's, that's where I'm going when you say this, cause that's so powerful, but I don't, people don't think about it that way. No. Well, and they often think of it, they think of connecting and networking as one and the same. Mm. I fervently believe there's a difference. And for people who may be shy or introverted, connecting should be, much more comfortable, feasible, um, doable. And the reason being is it's much more one-on-one, -on -one, one -on two going deep when networking is very much kind of going around and shaking hands with everybody in the room and taking business cards or, you know, doing that in an online meeting room as well, right? As opposed to doing a deep dive, getting to know somebody over the stretch of years, over the stretch of months. So it isn't something that just happens overnight. So your book is called The Lost Art of Connecting. So tell me more about this lost art. Why have we lost our ability to connect human to human and yeah. what do we do about it? Yeah. Well, a lot of people, when they see the title of the book, assume that I wrote it in response to the pandemic. Yeah. But, <laughs> but actually, it was um, the the inspiration and idea for the book um, started about four or five years ago when I had witnessed, and I think many of us could agree, that we had lost our intentionality when we made connections. We would mm. dash off a, a direct message on a, on a social platform, or we would, um, you know, just hit, hit send without thinking about what we're saying. Um, or we started to measure our success in connecting by the number of followers or the number of clicks on a particular article we posted, when in actuality, in 20 years from now, those platforms that we have been living on are there's going to be new platforms. So mm -hmm. all the numbers in the world don't really, really matter. And that isn't what necessarily impacts us the same way a meaningful connection does. So fast forward, when I got the green light uh, to go forward writing the book, it was February of 2020. And of course, mm -hmm. March, everything <laughs> fell apart. And what I learned during all the interviews I did for the book was during those first eight months, we really started to put more value on our relationships and our mm -hmm. connections. And I do think that that has continued to this present day. But my, my goal in the book was really to kind of get back to that, in that, that compassion and intentionality and thoughtfulness as opposed to just whipping off a text or a, a missive on whatever social platform we tend to gravitate towards. My colleague and co-author, we were actually writing our book, Work Better Together, which has you know, some in incredible alignment with your book about, you know, the, the importance of relationships at work and the impact on our well-being. And the same thing happened to us. I mean, we in earnest kind of started writing it in January of 2020. And it was it was fascinating because there's a whole the whole front section of our book actually deals with the impact that technology has had on our ability to um, build meaningful relationships mm -hmm. in, in the workplace. And so I think we were kind of r running parallel there. But can you talk about like from your perspective and what you wrote about in your book and and also kind of where we're going now, right? I mean, I, you know, I don't know that in the workplace for many of us, we're ever going back to being, you know, fully in person the way that we might have been um, during the pandemic, but so many organizations, Deloitte included, are grappling with, okay, well, how do we not lose human connection in in this world that is increasingly digital? Right. No, I agree with you. I don't think we are going to go back to any sense of like the old normal. Um, there will be a new normal, and I do fervently believe that it's going to be a mashup of some sort. Um, but human connection is still the best way to have meaningful conversations institutions, organizations, companies, organizations are all going to have to go above and beyond to help their employees and their members um, and their participants feel more connected. If we say to our employees, oh, you know, bring your full self to work, that we bring our full selves to work. Mm -hmm. We can't expect others to be open and vulnerable if we as the leaders are not going to be doing that, right? Um, and then doing what you can that when you are physically together, it isn't all about the work. 
right? It is much more focused on what you bring as a person. What are your superpowers? What are your desires and your likes? Because we know that our times together are going to be somewhat limited. So let's fill them with as much joy as we can. That is, that's what I see the new kind of workplace. I'm not saying it's going to be filled with all fun and no work. But I do think when you, when people are going to be together, they're going to want to be more celebratory and then they can go back to, to their you do better work. <laughs> yeah. 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 And in some ways, it might become something to look forward to. I I was reading, um, it was an entrepreneur who was based in Scotland. And four years ago, when he founded his company, he couldn't recruit good programmers because nobody wanted to move to the north of Scotland in the middle of winter. Um, so he set his company up as virtual. People could work from all over the world and they succeeded. And instead of when they got together that it was, you know, three days of working, they would go to like a place like Tulum or somewhere like that, you know, or, uh, you know, Maui, so that it would be celebratory as opposed to work. And I thought that that was just a, a very interesting way. And he said, instead of trying to get us back, why not reinvent the future? Kind of leading into this, you know, I read that you don't separate your work and personal connections, which I found to be really interesting because there's so much um, that I talk about and that I believe in that's around, you know, the old thinking around like work life separation and work life balance. And now it's moving into integration and those types of things. So talk to me about why you don't separate those connections and and how that benefits you and what that looks mm -hmm, like. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll start by saying it's hard enough being one human, let alone two. <laughs> Back in the mid 90s, when the internet kind of came into our lives, um, I used to lug home a ginormous laptop that was the size of my refrigerator. And at night, I would um, go ahead and dial up my, you know, I'd plug my computer into the phone jack and I would send all my email. And then while it was sending, I would go and do my dishes. And then I would come back to my computer, hands covered in suds, and start reading all the emails that had been downloaded. That was the day I fervently believed that I was no longer work Susan and home Susan. Because there I was with you know soap suds all over my hands, dripping over my computer. Um, and what I found over the years, I like to do business with people I enjoy. I like to do business with, with friends. I like to help friends get jobs and then work with them. So is that work Susan or home Susan? Hmm. And I, what became apparent in the last 10 years were these concept, concentric networks or, or communities all overlapped. And I was the same person running McPherson Strategies as I was hosting a fundraiser for a particular um, nonprofit that I was passionate about. You know, our lives are so complicated. It's almost more challenging to try to distinctly differentiate. What I am, though, want to, what I want to be clear or I want to clarify is I'm not saying I work 24 by 7. I'm just saying I'm the same person whether I'm working mm -hmm. or I'm not. Thank you for clarifying that for the chief well-being officer. <laughs> so, so let me ask you, what do you say to the people that push back or believe that you shouldn't, you know, have friends at work or work with your friends or do business with your friends? And we tackle this a little bit in, in our book as well. So I'd love to hear your perspective on it. Well, I would first cite Rob Cross's research. He's a Babson, uh, he's a professor at Babson College that has proved that when you have mm -hmm. friends at work, you are much more likely to um, stay at the company, you are going to be much more productive, and you're going to be happier at your job. So, you know, I would, st I would, I would first cite the data. Yeah. <laughs> and then I would say, if you don't want to have friends at work, that's your prerogative. OK, none, none of this is forced, um, but you will if you allow yourself, you will see the benefits. But I also then say to the powers that be that run these institutions, you have to create the space so that people feel comfortable. It isn't just about, oh, here, you're hired. Go make friends with everyone. Right. Right. And you don't have to be friends with everyone. You, no. You know, that's not <laughs> we're not friends with everyone in life either. Right. So. Right. Right. So you also talk about purpose as a key theme throughout your book. So how does bring this together, understanding purpose, how does understanding your personal purpose help you build meaningful connections in your life? I mean, we know values align our, yeah. us with, with others. Um, and, you know, when, when you're able to look at your North Star, your hopes and dreams, and you're able to share those with others, chances are others will then share those back with you. They don't have to be identical to become friends, but being able to 
um, not only see someone and see someone for who they are, but listen and then make the mental um, note that therefore you can be helpful to them is what I think of when I think of purpose. Mm. And to me, that is the way to start the process of a reciprocal relationship that can stand the test of time. But again, it, you know, when we think of the word purpose, we immediately think of, you know, uh, like doing good or volunteering to change the world. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Um, But I think when we make introductions and make connections, we are changing the world. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I think that that um, really helps demystify purpose for people. Because I do think oftentimes when people think of purpose, they think that it has to be something big or otherwise it's, you know, not worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's kind of almost opposite of that in a lot of ways. So, all right. So let's dig in. Um, I want to get into your methodology for connection that you share in your book. Absolutely. Uh, Well, I learned when you write a business book and you probably did as well, Jen, that you have to have a methodology, right? Yes. (laughs) I'm like the opposite of methodology human. Um, I don't know if that even makes sense, but I could unpack it at another time, I guess. But I realized, you know, this enormous community I had built in my, again, not to be redundant, but in my 20s and my 30s and my 40s actually happened because I was doing something. And I did do a lot of um, self-reflection to figure out what it is that I was doing. And the book is broken into three sections called Gather, Ask, Do. And I'll give you um, kind of a 30,000 foot view of each. And obviously, if anybody wants to read it, they can learn a lot more. In the gather section, the first um, person you connect with is yourself. And you do a bit of a deep dive to determine what are your superpowers. And once you figure out what your superpowers are, you think about how you are going to do everything in your power as you connect with others to break that hermetically sealed bubble that typically prevents you from meeting people who don't look like you, don't sound like Mm. you, the same age as you, it's the same race and and cultural um, background as you. You also think during Gather, who is it that I want to connect with or reconnect with that my superpowers can be helpful to? Because the underlying theme of the entire book is flipping what we traditionally have thought of what networking and connecting is to instead of what can I get, it's how can I help? Mm. So in, in, in the gather section, to reiterate, to be able to understand how you can be helpful to others, you need to think, what is it that you bring to the table? Okay. And lastly, in gather, you think about what your goals are for the next one year, three year, five years. So that's all within gather. In the ask phase, you think about, and you do, learn how to ask the meaningful questions of others so that you can learn what their hopes and dreams are, what their goals are. And if you listen very, very carefully while they're sharing this with you, you can go to the do phase. And the do phase is my favorite. Um, And that is where you take all that data that you listen to and you go into action. And this is back to what we were just talking about earlier. This doesn't mean you have to, you know, write a check for a hundred million dollars or five hundred dollars, or you know, you have to give up your first child. This means like you make an introduction for someone, you make a connection, you connect somebody on LinkedIn, um, you connect them on a, on whatever you know platform of social media choice you you tend to prefer. You um, you know. Uh, offer up a a nonprofit that you think might pique someone's interest based on what you heard from that person. So that is what Gather, Ask, Do is. And dare I say that given the world we've been living in, it's never a better time to think about now how you can start building your connections based on not only what your future goals are, but also how you can be helpful to others. Yeah, especially how we can be helpful to others. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, you know, let's, we kind of touched on this earlier, and we, you know, about, about networking, right? And so hopefully as we, we start to go back to some more in-person events um, and networking events, um, you know, networking, it is a necessity for many of us mm-hmm. at work. Um But if you're like me, like I said, you know, you kind of cringe at the thought of it. So are there any tips for making networking less awkward? How do we take network? How do we, you know, view a networking 
event more like a connecting event, I guess. I love that. And, and, you know, I will add, you know, whether it's virtual or in person. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I, I have a, um, one thing I like to share and it's something I call my triumvirate, um, AKA the power of three and think about an event that you have upcoming and do a little research. Oftentimes you can find out who's going to be in the room again, whether it's an online room or a real, um, honest to goodness room. And think intentionally about the three people you want to meet. Think about the three things you want to share. And tell yourself you're going to walk away learning three things. And guess what? That's doable. That's feasible. That's achievable. And then you can go hide in the bathroom or you know, <laughs> go, home. <laughs> go home or go to your hotel room or order room service, right? Um, but to me, that's a, that's a fair way to kind of like tackle what could seem like you know, the worst thing in the world. Um, but again, just to, to reiterate, by, you know, by sharing three things, you're being vulnerable. By learning three things, the others are being vulnerable, right? Um, and by intentionally seeking out three people, you're thinking about what, you know, what are three people that po- potentially can help me meet my goals? And how can I help them? Um, and again, it's not walking around and, you know, shaking hands with everyone. Um, and thankfully, you know, with the technology we have today, you often can find out who's going to be there. Yeah. You know, I joke my, my first, um, real professional role at a company was at USA Today in the eighties. And I was a researcher and I used to have to interview people over the phone and then, you know, gather all their data and, to prepare for those interviews, I had the Encyclopedia Britannica and the Yellow yellow Pages, um, which, of course, today, you know, think how much you can find out about people before you actually meet them. Right. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Sometimes it's scary how much you can find out about people before you meet them. (laughs) 100% agree. So, so let's kind of shift back to the workplace a little bit and, you know, colleagues, but also, you know, team leaders. And and you talked a little bit about this um, in terms of connecting and getting to know each other, but how can we do that, you know, on a regular basis? Sure, sure. Well, I always say everything but the weather talk. Okay. (laughs) Um, Years ago, I lived in Denmark when I was in college and my Danish father, who I lived with, this was 1985, said to me, you Americans, all you want to do is talk about the weather because you don't like silence. (laughs) What's funny is ever since then, every conference call and of course now every virtual, you know, video call, guess what everybody talks about for the first five minutes? And you know why? Because it's safe and it's not scary. We're not opening up anything about ourselves that will share anything. So what I like to do is have a revolving door of who's going to be the host. So if it's mm. a regular weekly meeting, um, that person is responsible. So that one gets, you know, new voices into the mix Two, you know, have different prompts um, for, for, you know, a, a start of a, of a gathering as silly as, you know, what was your favorite food as a child to when this pandemic is over, you know, where in the world could you go if, if budgets weren't an option? And these types of questions get people talking about things that they don't typically talk about in the office or the virtual office. And it does open up people, you know, these aren't dangerous questions. In other words, you're not, you're not putting people in an awkward situation when you ask them these types of things. Um, And I think that that encourages curiosity um, and it, it helps define the commonality in the uncommonality that so many of us share. Because I do believe we have more in common than we don't, but we often just don't get to a place where we talk about those things. And you'd you you know, you'd be surprised how many kids, if they grew up in a certain time period, the, the, they have the same favorite food, right? Mm-hmm. And then they discover that about themselves. Or you learn about you know a culture that perhaps you didn't ever even stop to think about. So yeah. I, I think that these types of prompts can be very, very helpful. Um, and, you know, I, I think also um, preparing ahead of time and, and giving people the grace to, uh, you know, whoever's hosting to, to let that person come up with his, her or their ideas about, you know, what is it the theme that they want to use. I love that. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and I, I love kind of staying away from the weather talk because I do live in Miami, Florida. So I usually get chastised for the fact that like, yes. <laughs> you know, when everybody else is freezing, they'll, they're like, Jen, don't even tell us what the weather is like in Miami. We don't want to know. <laughs> so, so that's great advice to stay away from the weather talk. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, bless you. But I, I mean, I would be so much more interested to like find out what your favorite restaurants are in Miami or, you know, what, what it's like to have the sand between your toes. Like that to me would be more interesting. Yeah, I was absolutely. Well, well, Susan, thank you so much uh, for for this conversation, for being on the show. Um, there's so much that I still need to go and think about and process um, that you said here, and I know the listeners are going to get a ton out of this. And I just have had a smile on my face this entire conversation. So, um, thank you again for being on the show. Thank you, Jen. You are a superstar, and I am honored to have joined you today. I'm so grateful Susan could be with us today to talk about the lost art of connection. Thank you to our producers, Rivet360, and our listeners. You can find the WorkWell podcast series on Deloitte.com, or you can visit various podcatchers using the keyword WorkWell, all one word, to hear more. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe so you get all of our future episodes. If you have a topic you'd like to hear on the Work Well podcast series, or maybe a story you would like to share, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. My profile is under the name Jen Fisher or on Twitter at JenFish23. We're always open to your recommendations and feedback. And of course, if you like what you hear, please share, post, and like this podcast. Thank you and be well. <laughs>